I'm Saira Mitta, and I'll be the moderator for the panel today. I'm so glad I got to meet these beautiful souls before we started for a little bit. Thank you all for coming to this important event as we explore the role of philanthropy in countering hate. The way I look at it, not participating is surrender, and that is not an option. So let's get started on a positive foot because we have three esteemed guests on our panel today. And I have this lovely note to kind of remind them that they have one minute left, so I'll be passing that down just so you know. So in our first chair here is Reverend Jim Baird Jacobs. He's a native Minnesotan and a member of the Stockbridge Muncie Mohican Nation. He has lots of degrees in pastoral studies, Christian theology, and has served many churches as youth minister, adult Christian ed educator, and director of men's ministries. Currently, he is parish associate at Church of All Nations Presbyterian Church. He has brought light to issues of Native American causes and injustices. He is the director of community engagement and racial justice for Minnesota Council of Churches. Great work is happening through that organization. He is the creator and director of Healing Minnesota Stories, ensuring that the Native American voices continue to be heard loud and clear. Welcome, Reverend Jim Baird. Then we have Rabbi Ariel Lakash Rosenberg. Excuse my mispronunciations, I'm trying to do my best. She is the shepherd of her flock at Shertikwa. She finished rabbinical school at Hebrew College in Boston while working as a full-time rabbinic fellow at BJ in New York City, doing the bi-city thing for a year. What drew her to Minnesota was the musical energy of Shertikwa congregation. She focuses on meaning making, and I wish we could all do a little bit more of that. We need to ask ourselves, how do we make meaning of our lives? And that's what excites her. The intersection of prayer, music, and social justice is the work that excites her. She also plays the accordion. We tried to get one for you this morning, but we couldn't. Welcome, Rabbi Ariel. Alejandra. Hernandez Chavez. Alejandra currently works as Isaiah's Latino and immigration organizer. She brings her lived experience to the stage today. Alejandra immigrated from a border town in Mexico and grew up in the USA as an undocumented immigrant. Immigrant justice is close to her heart. Working closely with Latino communities in Catholic parishes on creating an immigrant's bill of rights and with Isaiah Sanctuary Network. Welcome, Alejandra. As a rabbi, how do you deal with anti-Semitism personally and in the lives of the members of your synagogue? Thank you. L'shem yichud kudshem brichu in the name of, I wanna offer my words in service of bringing together broken pieces. And just wanna begin with gratitude Gratitude to Imam Saad and to Reverend Curtis, to everyone on the, on the stage, Dr. Saira and Reverend Jim Baer. Alejandra, thank you so much. It is so good to be here on this ancestral land of the Dakota and Anishinaabe. It is so good to be here in the room with all of you. I'm going to try to speak slowly and catch my breath because this time has me breathless. And I'm gonna to try to speak slowly and catch my breath because I need to believe this is not the only time we're gonna be talking together. And so I'm going to speak through my fear of not saying the right thing and of leaving important pieces out because I need us to be in relationship and my people need us to be in relationship. And I know I can't do the work I need to do day to day in my community and I can't do the work of my life if I am so afraid of messing it all up. I've got to say this time has me so afraid of messing it all up. So I'm really grateful that Karen Rotz brought prophetic, oh, it was not you? Oh, I'm so glad that Steve brought home and Tushin. Thank you so much. So the, I'm sorry to all the other tables, but at table number two, credit and blame. Uh, we, we have home and Tushin, triangular cookies uh, that are the traditional food of the holiday of Purim, which we just celebrated this week. 
And Purim is, I feel like, the holiday of our moment. It's the story of someone who, in order to attain a position of power, has to hide their identity. Queen Esther, to become queen, hides her Jewishness and goes to live in the palace and confront systems of oppression and threats of violence. Um, and while the story of Purim is not necessarily going to be our blueprint for how it is that our movements should move for justice, uh, because it ends in massacre, I do want to bring Queen Esther into the room. And I want to bring this holiday of revelry and costumes and joy into the room because I think it's a helpful teacher. What does it mean to live in moments of deep oppression, to navigate systems where so many of our bodies are carrying the habits of hiding and of living in silos and say, how do we stay alive? How do we stay joyful? How do we stay in relationship through it? So I'm going to bring Queen Esther onto the stage with us. Uh, so I am from Oregon originally. I am uh, a third generation American. My family comes from Eastern Europe, from Czechoslovakia, and from Lithuania, and from Poland. And my family traveled to the United States in the 1910s and 1920s. Uh, my great-grandparents were the only members of their family to survive the Holocaust, and uh, settled in Pittsburgh. My, both of my parents grew up on the same street in Pittsburgh. And my dad uh, dragged my mom across the country to Oregon because he had fantasies of being a hippie. So I grew up in Portland in the 80s and 90s at the height of KKK activity. Uh, I was very used to wearing a Jewish star and hiding it when we would leave the city of Portland because we, were, we weren't sure who we were going to be meeting and what that was going to mean for us. And I think that, and I also grew up at the height of um, incredible threats of violence against people of color and uh, really, and a system and a city sort of under siege trying to figure out how to handle this white supremacist and white nationalist violence. Um, my best friend's family, his, the father was the lawyer involved in bankrupting the KKK in the Pacific Northwest, which was the only way we could figure out how to deal with that, that hatred. And so I became an activist. And I wanted Jewish people to be getting involved in politics and to be really focusing on local issues because I saw so many intersections between the dissemination of the, or the, the, the uh, demolishing of the forests in, in the Pacific Northwest and the violence against people of color and the lack of recognition of the native people of the land and my own experiences of anti-Semitism. And so I became an activist and by being an activist, I became a rabbi, which is not an, a usual story, but I know there are many of us in the room who have similar experiences of becoming clergy because we needed to sustain ourselves in the work and we needed our people to be sustained in the work. And that actually it wasn't possible for me and it wasn't possible for my people to stay activists if we weren't singing, if we weren't praying, if we weren't grounding in our bodies and grounding on the land. And so, in the last few years, I've watched as our progressive movements, my beloved movements, have been torn apart and threatened um, by confusion over anti-Semitism, right? As Jews have gotten sort of feeling uh, wrenched out of movements because we're not sure how to navigate dynamics of anti-Semitism on the left while we're simultaneously confronting really real threats of anti-Semitism on the right. As a rabbi, I've been navigating how do we, uh, um, threats are, claims of anti-Semitism in the movement for black lives and in the Women's March while also demanding that Jews stay involved, stay in the conversation and stay in relationship. And so in the last few years, the need to understand anti-Semitism has become much greater. And then certainly in November in 2018 with the Tree of Life shooting and the violence that has come since then, it has become so urgent that we really be speaking in clear terms about what anti-Semitism is, how it affects us, and how it is that we need to come together. So I am a rabbi, I am not a political scientist, but I just wanna say a few things about what anti-Semitism is, and then I wanna talk about how it's impacting uh, my community and our communities here in the Twin Cities. And there's one minute left, so I'm gonna do this so fast. Oy vey, what is time? <laughs> So I know. <laughs> a scarcity. So just to say that anti-Semitism has its origins in European Christianity. 
Uh, it's an ideological oppression that targets Jews and basically pre protects prevailing economic systems and the almost exclusively Christian ruling class by diverting blame for hardships onto Jews. It's cyclical. It means that it cycles between uh, periods of plenty and then periods of incredible threats of violence. But just because it's cyclical does not mean it's universal or inevitable. I think we need to continue to lean towards the possibility of new and liberatory dynamics, even as we recognize these cycles. And so my community has needed to upend our priorities over these last years. Um, we have needed to focus on security and really th doing uh, a lot of census work on how it is that we keep our building and our bodies safe instead of, and we've needed to uh, put immense amount of our resources that were budgeted towards other things into that security work. Um, our communities are living with simmering fear. Our kids aren't coming to school because they're afraid of being in the building. And our bodies are holding both trauma and secondary trauma, which means that not only are we carrying the immediate experiences of threat and concern, but also we're carrying in our bodies the stories of our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents. And those stories reverberating in our bodies take up a lot of our airspace, a lot of our breath. Um, and it's also exposed fault lines in our community, which keeps us much less stable. Uh, 12 to 15% of Jews are Jews of color, and the experience of Jews of color navigating both racism and anti-Semitism has really uh, created wedges between white Jews and Jews of color, and we need to do a lot of work. This is insider baseball, but we need to do a lot of work to figure out how it is that we hold ourselves in this time. And I really want to name with my remaining seconds uh, the incredible work of JCA and the JCRC and people who are doing, really, please apl applaud. Um, be because as, as rabbis, I'm, I'm good at praying. I'm good at reading Torah. Like, I want to be talking about spirituality, and I'm so grateful to our incredible organizers and our thinkers for helping keep us safe and keeping us moving in the right direction. So I look forward to talking more, and I'm grateful for this time. Question for Reverend Jim Baer. Uh, as a Native American Christian minister, what are the ways you address racism directed towards you and your Native American community? And how do you address this racism, especially when it comes from the Christian community? Well, um, you get labeled a heretic a lot. Um, it, it's difficult because um, racism against Native Americans is just built into the very fabric of who we are as America. Uh, I was going to do this um, very poignant little uh, sort of Sunday school lesson plan and pull a $20 bill out of my wallet. Uh, but I have four kids, ages 13 and younger, so it's been a long time since my wallet has seen a $20 bill. <laughs> but uh, on, on our $20 bill is Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson, while running for his uh, term as President of the United States, was known as a great Indian killer. And so every time I participate in economic commerce and open up my wallet, I am forced to adhere to a system that directly um, benefits and stated goal was the complete genocide and removal of my people. And that is the difference. You know, so I was in a, I forget which synagogue I was in uh, when I was speaking and uh, a Jewish gentleman came up to me and, and he said, you know, we're a lot of like Jews and natives because of our shared experience of genocide. And I said, well, there's one difference. I said, find me any currency across the globe that bears the image of Hitler or any SS officer. Find me any building that is named after an SS officer or Hitler or any of these Nazi soldiers. 
See, the difference is when you perpetrate a genocide and you lose the war, you don't get buildings named after you, you don't get uh, your face on currency. But when you perpetrate genocide and you win the war, then your face goes on money. There are streets named after you. There are buildings named after you. And where racism, where we see racism come, come up uh, for natives, uh, it seems that Christian churches, uh, government agencies, white people in general are very content to leave native people alone as long as we stay cloistered in our little reservations and we only concern ourselves with what happens within our borders. But see, I came of age in the 1990s when our Anishinaabe relatives up in northern Minnesota were beginning to exercise their God-given, government-given treaty rights. And you could go to any boat landing up in northern Minnesota during the uh, fishing season, and you would see white people holding signs that would say, uh, protect a walleye and spear an Indian. Um, I, I've lost count of the times where I've had the derogatory slur of prairie nigger thrown at me. And it's even become somewhat comical because as a Mohican, we are woodland people. We never saw a prairie, but... Um, it gets embedded, uh, you know, as a pastor, it's embedded into our church history. Just two days ago, I read an article about a conservative pap, uh, pastor uh, uh, talking about how um, our ritual, our native ritual of smudging, the burning of sage, um, is demonic. It's of the devil. Yet this same pastor will walk into a church where they're burning incense and suddenly feel a sensory connection to the divine. And the only difference between incense and smudging is who's holding it. It's the only difference. Here in our country, our commonly held narrative is that um, we pride ourselves on the religious freedom that is uh, embedded into the First Amendment. Right? We, we, we have uh, an entire national holiday in which we celebrate those uh, brave refugees who are fleeing religious persecution and established a new society around the inclusion of a diversity of religious beliefs. Religious freedom did not come to the Native American until 1978. Now scanning the room that is within the lifetime of most people in this room, 41 years ago, 42 years ago, 1978. Prior to that, you could be jailed and arrested for carrying a pipe, for attending ceremony, for holding sacred feathers. And the, um, but I think the, the, the biggest thing that I deal with in terms of racism for Native people is the invisibility that accompanies the erasure of your identity. We just do not exist in the commonly held imagination of American society. In most people's consciousness, Native Americans do not live in the 21st century. Hell, we don't live in the 20th century. We are stuck in the 19th century. And if you, at your next gathering of family or um, somewhat large gathering, 
if you were to do this thought experiment and ask the people there to picture a Native American, just a generic Native American, in their mind, they're going to be dressed in buckskin, wearing feathers, probably war paint on. We're stuck in the 19th century. And the impact that that has is, um, it's insidious. My, my daughter, my 13-year-old, the reason why I don't have $20 bills anymore, um, she teaches in our, in our school system she teaches the lesson for native heritage and culture for the for, at the fourth grade level. So she's in, she's in seventh grade now and she actually goes back to the elementary school and, and teaches. And it's something that she loves to do. And last year, because um, you know, we all, we, we build up, we've got to get the collection of drums and jingle dresses and everything to bring in. And she teaches us, she gets very excited about it. And last year, when she came home afterwards, I said, Rainbow, what, uh, how did it go today? And she started to weep. And I said, what happened? And she said, they asked me how many people I've scalped. And when you don't live in the 21st century, these are the questions. And this was a question, I promise you, because I have been asked these same questions by fifth graders, by high schoolers, by full-grown adults. When you don't live in the 21st century, when your identity has been erased from the collective consciousness, when you're stuck, these are the questions you get asked. And the sad part is, is they are not just people who are being smart asses trying to make a little snappy, quirky thing. That I can respect. I can respect people who are trying to be a smart ass. These are legitimate questions that they're asking. And it breaks, it breaks our heart. Broke her heart. The pain stays the same. You can change the faces, but the pain stays the same. And that is what we need to erase. And we need to erase it together, not alone. Thank you so much for your time. Our next question is for you, Alejandra. As a Latina woman who has spent much of your life as an undocumented person and as a community organizer working to combat racism in Minnesota, Please share with us about your experience and the work Isaiah is doing to counter hate in Minnesota. Well, hi everyone, buenos dias. Um, I will identify myself again. My name is Alejandra Hernandez Chavez. Um, I'm currently the Latino and immigration organizer in the metro area for Isaiah and Faith in Minnesota. And it's what actually brought me here. I'm actually a couple of days away from hitting my one year anniversary of being in the state of Minnesota, um, which has been an interesting year. <laughs> um, but as you know, the, the question implies, so I am from a town, a city called Mexicali, which is in Baja California, uh, which is the small peninsula that's underneath California. And I came here when I was about, I was just two months away from being six on a very lucky break of actually being able to get a visa to go on a trip to Disneyland and just staying. Um, and I think that the, you know, since then, it took me about nine years to become a permanent resident. It was gonna take about 13 to 15, but my mom became a citizen and her becoming a citizen bumped us up because she was the person who was petitioning my older sister, my father, and I. Uh, and it took me another year to become a citizen. So I'm a, I'm a US citizen now. And I think when I was ta talking about this panel in this space, and what I can bring into it is this fabricated lie that our immigration system gives us. And I think also the clarity that like our immigration system is not broken 
our immigration system is strategic and oppressive. And it does what it does fine-tuned. It knows what it's doing. Uh, and the constant lie that as immer immigrants we receive that like once you have a nine digit number and you have something that identifies you as part of this country, it's suddenly like there has somehow like the earth has parted and there is now space for you in the United States. Like before there wasn't, you were standing on someone, you were in someone's space, but now the earth has moved and you, there is space for you and you're good and you're fine. And I think, you know, something I don't tell people often is that, you know, for the first two years of the presidency of the current president that we have, I walked around with my US passport because I don't stop looking brown. You know, people don't stop looking at me and saying, that's probably, a, I was gonna say Latina, but I mean, if we're honest, people will probably be like, that's a Mexican. And I am a Mexican, but they'd probably be like, that's a Mexican. Deportation rates for US citizens have actually gone up since 2012. And our government in those situations, instead of admitting that they have deported someone who is part of this country, they have actually worked to denaturalize people so that we don't actually have to admit that we've made a mistake. So we're always in the right. And it's always been difficult growing up in an odd space. Um, I think in Spanish, we constantly say like, no eres de aquí ni de You're not from here and you're not from there. Um, and it's an interesting space to live in in a, in a different interaction that all of us have dependent on our immigration status. If we're somehow protected, if we're not protected at all or not acknowledged, or if we are acknowledged and what that actually means. Uh, and so some of, the, some of the interactions that the community has are still interesting. And I think it's, you know, we're at a time where I don't think it really matters what kind of status you have. I think everyone is scared. And if you're not scared, you're probably hiding that you're, not scared, that you're scared. Because you don't know how to process the fact that there is so many hits we're taking and you don't even know where to acknowledge the blow that you just took. I think especially for myself as someone who does immigration organizing in this state, it has provingly been more difficult to get Latinos into a room because they feel if they organize, the, the, well the narrative of an immigrant is like you keep your head down, you like stay quiet, you live while they let you live here, and when they find you and if they remove you, then you deal with what they've given you. And so it's been increasingly hard to organize folks around immigrant justice and around their, their rights because folks are so scared to go to something and be like, well, you advertise this as an immigration event. What if ICE shows up? Or what if you're baiting me into something? What am I actually walking into? So I'd rather not take the chance to actually like step into some political agency and use my voice because I'm too afraid that that will actually draw attention to me and, talk, and, and show that I'm here and I'm taking up someone else's space. So the work that I do with Isaiah is increasingly important and I, I wanna talk a little bit about the work that we do as an organization as a whole um, because I feel so honored to be in an organization that is made up of member mosques and churches and childcare centers and barber shops. Because truly what we're building towards and what we're doing is building the political voice and political agency of the communities that don't necessarily feel they have that. So our black, our Muslim, our Latino communities. While on the other hand, also developing communities around the state, like in St. Cloud and Wilmer and in other places in greater Minnesota that are currently, thank you, that are currently struggling through conversations 
of white folks who don't know what their place is in this movement and how we can actually create some, some work and narrative and space for people to be uh, honest about where we're at and to all know that we have stick, stick in the game. We all have a place in what we're, what we're doing and if we, we're working towards a multiracial democracy that has a caring economy that actually respects the, a, a base of multiracial people and multi-faith people, and actually fulfilling the promise that not only the state of Minnesota, but the United States as a whole has failed on, is this promise of democracy that we've never actually fulfilled because we've not acknowledged our multiracial population. And how that, man that manifests in so many different ways, but specifically through the organizing that I do with our Latino community, it's like, you know, in a couple months, we're gonna train 200 Latinos, uh, and my base is mostly made of undocumented people. So how do you uh, have folks experience political agency when our system's already built to shut them out? And how do you think around that? So we're gonna train 200 Latino leaders to each develop a list of 15 people that they know that can vote. And in, in showing them how to engage those people so that the voice of these undocumented people is carried through voters that they know. And their recommendations and suggestions are taken into the polls in a pseudo way, but it was built by a Latino base of people who know what it is that they need in the state of Minnesota and are actually fighting towards it in whatever way that they can actually find to experience some political agency. And I'm pretty sure I'm out of time. So each of you now gets the same question and I'm super interested in seeing how do we design a shared approach to countering hate? We're all coming from different areas of our life, but how do we come together to design a shared approach to countering hate in Minnesota? And do you guys believe that the various forms of hate that we are encountering and discussing today are rooted in white supremacy? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, personally, and I have the great honor of working at an organization that agrees with me, um, but I definitely see some of the some of the, the hate, whether it be xenophobic, Islamophobic, homophobic, regardless of what kind of hate it is, is, is definitely a product of white supremacy. Uh, and I think our understanding of white supremacy is that it's an ideology that comes with practices, that comes with beliefs of folks. And I think our, the way that I see us combating, because we, we definitely have to defeat white supremacy to live into the kind of, the, the world as it should be. And I think my belief in that, and, I, and why I deeply appreciate the work that I do, is because there's twofold things into that. It is being able to develop people, have them, have them grow, who are in communities who are most directly impacted. Have those people, whether they be black, Muslim, Latino, immigrant, have them actually grow in their capacity to experience power and to experience you know, public agency so that they can grow in what they actually can advocate for themselves. And on the other hand, it's also you know, white supremacy is something that has oppressed all of us. And specifically for white folks, it, it, it cuts you out of the conversation uh, and only allows you sometimes in through guilt. And, you know, a lot of the work that we do is actually letting white folks see what their pain is and how white supremacy has also affected them. Because if you only guilt people into a movement, or if they're only operating out of that space, then when the kitchen gets hot, people are not gonna be there. People are gonna back out. But if we actually have a conversation with folks, and I really like what uh, Reverend Sekou said, if we're honest about where we're at, and also acknowledging that folks have to wrestle 
white folks have to wrestle with the pain that they have from white supremacy and what it has taught them and how it allows them to show up in the spaces, then we actually can move people forward into walking into this multiracial space together. Because we, we, they've been cut out of the conversation as well. And if you don't know what your stake in the game is, if you don't know what your skin is, then you're not gonna stand or move through this movement in the correct space or in the correct mindset. And I think that when I think of, like I said, I think a lot of the hate that we experience and a lot of the things we see are come out of white supremacy, but it's how we combat it, how we allow people, everyone to show up and to decide how it is that this has brought them pain and to move onwards from it, to decide that they're gonna be change makers, that we're gonna live in a different society outside of what white supremacy has taught us for all of us is really how I see us fighting back. So I think that that's, a, that's the kind of design that we will hopefully see in Minnesota, or at least I'm definitely trying to ensure that I see in Minnesota through the work that I'm doing. So for me, when I'm sitting with people on a, da on a daily, on a weekly basis, I'm sitting with people as they're processing terror at climate crisis. I'm sitting with people as they're processing fear, walking, sitting on a bus wearing a kippah. I'm sitting with people as they're processing the, the trauma of sitting with a coworker and hearing hate speech come out of their mouth, right? So it's getting inside of people's bodies every day, right? And I think one of the things we really need is to be creating more spaces for people to be sharing stories, holding it together and learning what to do, right? To be building more power together and building more resources and structures to be able to really, an analysis to understand what is happening in our moment and what is happening in our region. I think that people, as they're feeling fear, part of the reason they're feeling fear is because they're not seeing appropriate action being taken. They're not seeing community really saying anti-Semitism is wrong, homophobia is wrong, right? And this is what we're going to do about it. And so I think that part of the work that we get to do in a multi, uh, cross-class, cross-racial uh, coalition and the movement building is to really say how is it that we are taking this on seriously, calling out oppression as it is landing on each of our communities and showing up for each other. The, one of the moments that where, where my community at Shirtikva really sang and felt relief was immediately after the Tree of Life shooting when members of mosques and churches showed up outside of our doors and basically created a ring of safety around us so we could pray together. And just that feeling of nothing's going to happen to us today because our neighbors are here, right? We're going to teach each other how to be neighbors, right? And I think the other piece is that my community is behind, right? Our analysis is a little bit dull. We need to understand, but we, we know that white supremacy is the water that we swim in. It's the air that we breathe, but we don't understand how the organizing works. We don't understand how it is that people are internalizing this rhetoric and then acting it out in hate speech and in acts of violence. And I think that one of the ways that as communities of faith, we can grow in strength and also in action is by developing a much sharper analysis about how it is that this, this hate speech and hate, hate action is, being, is proliferating. Um, and the, the final piece that feels so important is we can't just find each other on stages. Right? We can't just find each other in rooms like this where you're looking at each other's backs. That actually we need so many more spaces to come together, to meet each other, to know each other's story, to build trust because it wasn't so long ago that, that there was redlining in, this, in the Twin Cities in Edina, right? It wasn't so long ago that segregation was law. Now it's just the practice. Right now we still live in silos, we have the habits, and I think it's the responsibility of the movement to really figure out how is it that we're breaking these, these habits down, these borders that have been imposed on our bodies and on our communities, how is it that we're really transgressing those borders and finding each other and getting smarter and braver together? So do I think that all of this is rooted in white supremacy? Um, yes. Of course. Now, given that, how do we move forward uh, in a meaningful way? How do we as people of color and people representing marginalized communities come together in a meaningful way that uplifts our common causes, all of us? 
Um, you know, 15, 20 years ago, we would have come together and we would have been playing oppression Olympics on the stage here because we would have been in, in this scarcity mindset that, okay, we've got a group, let's be honest, we've got a group of funders here. We've got a group of philanthropic organizations. There's only so many resources and we have to compete with each other for this. Now I think we are seeing um, bold voices come through um, women of color, black grandmothers, native grandmothers, uh, who are calling folks on the carpet about this. Um, I think we as a country, and this is a message that I offer for um, white churches, white organizations, uh, it is long past time to seriously be thinking about what reparations looks like in your communities, in your churches, in your organizations. Uh, to be very honest, in a room full of funders, in a room full of um, uh, philanthropists, uh, I know Curtis said that this was a safe space, but, uh, and I'm not making an ask, but I am asking you to take stock of where, where does the wealth that you manage come from? And a very real assessment would say that in terms of white wealth, it is very rare that there is any white wealth that is innocent of shed blood and stolen land. And so, um, it, you know, uh, as a minister, I look to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5 where Jesus is giving a teaching and he says, if you are presenting yourself at the temple to make an offering and there you realize that your brother or sister has something against you, stop. Don't make your offering. Leave the temple. Go and be reconciled to your brother or sister and only after that, come and make your offering. To de-Christianize that lesson a little bit, we cannot approach the divine unless we are about the work of reconciliation. And these are hard conversations to have. I have been speaking one message around native reparations to churches for the last four years. And it is a big ask, I, I tell the churches, Give your land back. Give your land back. It hasn't happened. I doubt it will. But these, you know, the problem is great. The solution will need to be great to meet the problem. But it takes courage. And that courage can only come when we live in relationship and trust. Because it is difficult to imagine giving land back to someone you don't know. There's fear built into that system because we're all thinking like little capitalists. Like I'm giving something of value to someone else, which means I will not have access to the benefits of that value, to the benefits of that wealth. But what would it look like if you build a relationship with indigenous communities, with other marginalized communities, and you say, I have this wealth, I have these assets that I did not earn. They belong to you. And because we live in relationship and because there is trust, I am going to trust that you will still allow me to access this. I am going to trust that you will still let our congregation meet every Sunday so we can worship as a community. That's a bold, bold action, but it's that kind of bold action that is needed to, to move us forward. Thank you for opening up your hearts, allowing yourself to be vulnerable, and allowing us to hear your stories. Thank you very much.